Hello, welcome back. My name is Kevin Zadrill, and I'm the host of this podcast, All Eyes on Me, a true story of addiction, recovery, and hope. And with us today uh, is uh, Vincent Lilly. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. Good to have you back again, Vincent. Always yeah, a pleasure. Uh, I thought it'd be great to kind of circle back a little bit and discuss more on recovery, something that uh, you've gone through on uh, several occasions and, and certainly have been a good mentor for other people. And uh, I thought it'd be a good opportunity here just for your insight, uh, because it's talked about a lot within the book um, on recovery and really what that means uh, and, and entails for, for people, because I know it's different for everybody. Yeah, I think uh, that's one of the, the big struggles for a lot of the treatment facilities and all that kind of thing is the fact that uh, when it comes to recovery, obviously everybody's situation is unique, so it's really hard to tailor to every single different person. But um, what it ultimately comes down to is the willingness and, and uh, to, to deal with it on your own, to make that decision on your own and then going in and willing to face everything that comes at you on your own with your own decision without someone trying to push you or because mm -hmm. that makes a great difference, I think. Yeah. And, and there's, there's different uh, strategies for recovery too. I think you've been through several different types. Oh yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely different strategies and definitely different, different belief beliefs on how, how it should be done. But I, I wouldn't say that any uh, one of them was better than the other. I think that it's great that there's a different kind, lots of different kinds, because like I just said, there are plenty of different people when they are different, all unique situations. So some person can find one that will work for them and it won't work for the other. Yeah. And, and that sort of means for that person seeking treatment, um, is it just a matter of making that first step to get into treatment? Is that starting point? Uh, for sure. I think for sure it's, uh, it, it definitely starts with being 100% ready to make that commitment because uh, there's no such thing as being halfway in, halfway out because I've been there and trust me, it doesn't work. Being halfway in, halfway out, like, you know, it's like, for instance, there's, there's going to be these, these, uh, these clients for these treatment facilities that are, that are doing it for certain uh, reasons. Like let's say their kids got taken away from CFS. So let's say CFS is saying, you know, we, this is what you have to do in order to start the process of getting your kids back or someone's getting out of jail or getting bail from jail to a treatment facility and they're being ex ex uh, expected to follow certain conditions in order to you know uh, deal with their charges uh, in, in situations like these this is like a halfway in halfway out situation because they're basically being told that you got to do this in order to get that and like I said it has to be a decision that's made from within 100% not any other than, other than that. So someone that's, that's all the way in, goes through treatment, comes back out, what would be some advice to keep it successful? Because I know it's difficult. Um, yeah, I think the, I think that one of the, I say three of the things that keeps a lot of people stuck is that, you know, they've lived so many years in the, in the problem. Uh, with the drugs and alcohol that, you know, they, they build habits and behaviors uh, around what it is that they do. And it just becomes, it becomes, uh, in, it becomes them, you know? And so I think uh, people, places and things are three of the things that are uh, so, something that has to be addressed and changed, uh, especially upon being released from a treatment center, because those are the things that are triggers, main triggers for people. And, and for you, that meant uh, at, uh, when I when we met was at um, Pan Am Place, uh, and that sort of got you out of that people, places, and things, right? That was finally a significant change in in your life. Did you find that it was that stabilization of but, different? Because, I mean, uh, one, of, one of the why Pan Am Place is a choice for uh, people who struggle with addiction. Stabilization? Yeah. 
Oh yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, um, I just think that the expectations there are a little more higher. And I think that's good because you don't want someone who comes out of treatment uh, to become comfortable. Like not like, yeah, you don't want them to just be comfortable, right? You want them to be still stuck in that mode that they're in when they're in treatment. Because if they're not, then then they it'll make their brain, it'll allow their brain to have those chances to start thinking about those old thoughts, those old behaviors and that, and you want to keep them in that frame of mind that they're in when they're in the treatment center. So does it really mean a break away from old acquaintances and old locations? Is that something that's often uh, a fall? For sure. That's 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 for me, that was something that was huge for me because. Like I said, like I was saying, the point I was trying to make about uh, these habits and these behaviors that become us, um, we, we go back to what we know, right? Mm -hmm. And so those people, places, and things are the things that we know and are, are our comfort zones because we've had, we've been doing them for so many years. So um, it's really learned. It's like kind of like a learned behavior, right? It's over and over again. You have rep repetition of pl people, places, and things, and you got to unlearn that stuff. So in order to unlearn that stuff, you can't be going, you have to change it completely. And I think people should expect setbacks after treatment. It's not a sure oh, thing. Yeah. That's one of the things that, that people in treatment need to accept is the fact that they, they, obviously as much as we'd love to be perfect it, perfection is unattainable you know what i mean you shouldn't be trying to strive to be perfect because you need to realize that failures are a part of this process and and what's what's a good support network for someone that's trying to maintain that sobriety um i think it definitely starts with family um if you if you're involved with uh, any sort of religious um, uh, religious stuff, then you can definitely use that for sure. Uh, you know, whether it be God or whether it be um, native te teachings or whatever. But I would say, yeah, family and faith and uh, would be the two strongest ones. And there's there's a lot of stigma with with uh, addictions. And I think it, it paints a picture of someone and uh, not always in a positive light. How can we break that so that we can realize these are, these are real people with a real issue? Well, um, unfortunately, I think that, uh, I think stigma is always gonna be around, but um, it's not to lose sight with that being said, not to lose sight of the fact that we can still change it and how it's been dealt with and how it's been looked at. And the best way to do that, I think, is just to stay, to stay your course, and do what you need to do for yourself and, and uh, just be successful in that area. Because then the more of us that do it and success uh, succeed, then that's when, you know, the stigma is going to change a little bit more because then people can't say, oh, well, look at this and look at that, right? Mm -hmm. And you've been doing a lot of work with communities and, and groups to promote that, haven't you? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I did a documentary about that, actually. Uh, I got invited into the documentary. It was called uh, Addiction, It's Not What You See. And that was had to do with the whole stigma thing about how people, you know, get caught up in the stigmas and how a, a lot of people allow that stigma, the stigmas to actually drag them down and not to be successful in their, in their uh, addiction. Mm -hmm. But um, that's one of the things that needs to be taught to people that are on that road is, you know, that they're going to always have those people that are there that are going to be negative about that, but they need to realize that, uh, no matter how good you do in life, there's always going to be those people there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. An addiction at its worst could be a lot that's fueling, uh, you know, criminal activity crimes, which ends up leading to incarceration. And from your experiences in, in jail, that, that isn't or is 
and you will hear from you what your perspectives are while being incarcerated if it's a chance to deal with it or does it make it even worse for like being incarcerated right and and your addiction um it can be it can be uh it's not for sure one way or the other it can be uh it can help and it can hurt um but it all depends on the individual and what where they are at in their journey you know what i mean i think that's a big part of it is that um, it all depends on the person and where they're at in their journey. You know what I mean? Because for me, um, like the doctor said to me a few times that um, it literally saved my life because of the fact that uh, I, I, my uh, drug use and uh, drinking slowed down because I was incarcerated, right? I didn't get to do it as frequently as I did when I was on the street. So had I been out on the street doing it every day, like I was doing it, um, I probably would have been dead or, you know, like really sick. So incarceration can help you and it, or it could hurt you. It depends on, you know, the, the individual. Yeah. So for, for parents and with young children, teenage children, um, what, what would sort of be some advice and direction you can give them uh, with their children who could be, uh, if they notice that they're starting to get into that, that drug scene, alcohol scene? Um, well, I would definitely say the most important thing is not to try and give them, like not to try and uh, yell at them or give them a really hard time about it because I find that for myself, I basically just rebel against that, right? And so you want to basically, obviously, you want to try and just strengthen the relationship that you have with the child in, in order uh, to get to gain their trust. And then, you know, in these times of uh, struggle, you know, you want them to be able to feel comfortable to come to you if they ever need help or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the most important thing is you want to just try and strength, always strengthen your relationship with your kids and, uh, uh, yeah, definitely. A lot of parents, they, you know, they, they yell at their kids or, you know, get mad at them for the things, for the mistakes that they make, but the, the, they don't even realize that these mistakes are going to happen. Man. You don't, like, I'm not saying that you, you don't want a kid to get into trouble, mm -hmm. uh, but it's going to happen, right? Kids are going to get into trouble. And then when they get into trouble, uh, you're like, you know, you get pissed off, but you got to understand that these things are going to teach them. These are the lessons they need to learn. Mm -hmm. And they, like they say, it's not, uh, it, it's not the things that happen to you that define you. It's, uh, it's how you, it's how you react to any given situation. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, it comes down to being supportive. And really that starts at the areas of ages, right, with your children to start as, as soon as you can to develop that trust so that they're turning to you for advice and direction and disclosure and not other people, right? That's going to lead them down the wrong path. Yeah, for sure. So I know in your book, that was one thing you, you, you did highlight quite often was you rather have them coming to you to talk versus, you know, going down the street and talking to someone who's going to maybe influence them more with drugs or substances and and that's who they're going to be their support network yeah for sure i mean one of the, the one of the the things that i've heard that really stuck out in my mind was um if you want to change the world you should start at home so that just says it all right there you know what i mean uh, your your home is where your heart is and if your heart's not good and you can't really be very, of very much help to anybody. Yeah. yeah very true. And as you find with, with um, your work in the communities uh, for in particular, you know, men's resources, what, what's some of the advice directions that you've been giving to help them? Uh, because often um, they, they don't feel that they can seek help because it's, not something that you know men should do well i think uh yeah that's why a lot of these men's groups have started um in the city 
um, and just trying to uh, encourage the young the young men to try and get involved in that kind of stuff because we need to let them see that uh, the stuff the old way wasn't working. You know what I mean? That the stuff that's been taught to to our to our men and our kids and that. It, it doesn't work because it's not the way that it should be, right? We're all born the same, you know, like we all have the same emotions, right? So like once you can actually truly uh, face yourself and, and deal with your emotions and talk about them, it's completely beneficial in every area of your life. Mm -hmm. And that's just what I would say that I try, that I try and preach to kids, you know, to tell them, you know, that, I teach my kids, you know, like everything, you know, it's okay if you cry, um, you know, you can listen to sappy music, you can watch, doesn't matter what you watch on TV, right? Or you can like pink, you could wear a dress, you know, um, boys wear dresses, like stuff like that. All that kind of stuff is the stuff you want to teach, right? Because um, like they say, for instance, like racism, that's taught. Racism is taught, so you know you shouldn't be teaching your kids what you what your beliefs are unless it's like positive, right? It's like that's basically the kind of things you want to you know start trying to teach to the kids because there are a lot of a lot of young adults this in this day and age that have learned these types of things from their parents, like racism or being homophobic or stuff like that, right? So it starts there at home to teach it and to change it. And it's been getting a lot better in society that uh, to do with like um, being homophobic or to being racist. It's like, you know, it's definitely had a big change with, uh, and it, it started at people's homes. What kind of, um, you know, advice then, you know, when you go to the schools and you're, and you're speaking to the children, the kids in the schools, what, what's your message to them when you're standing in front of the class and what's something that you really want to have stick with them? If there's even one point that it just resonates with, with these kids. I think one of the main things that I like to say is, uh, you know, it starts with treating people how you want to be treated. You know what I mean? Because too many times these kids, a lot of the things that they see and they hear, they repeat. You know, and so these things that they, they that they do and say are not even them. It's not even themselves doing it or saying it. They're just you're just following. Mm -hmm. So you know, like it all boils down to you know, if someone I, like I say to my kids, if someone does, if my kid does something that I don't like to someone, I say to them, how would you feel if someone did that to you? You know, so that's where it begins. Is that you gotta like, you have to treat people how you want to be treated, and and. And when it comes to uh, teaching kids that a lot of them do see, they do, they do what they see, right? And so like you want to try and just get them in that mode where they're making decisions for themselves and not just being a follower. Be a leader, not a follower is what I say a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. and, and I think by that you mentioned in the book too that it's giving kids the ability to think on their own. And to learn on their own to make decisions on their own yeah and and that's uh a lot of the time that uh, the way kids behave and that is has to do with how they feel about themselves because uh yeah like the behavior in that um, a lot of the kids uh they don't even know that you know just by calling someone stupid they say, oh, I'm just joking, right? But they don't even realize it doesn't matter whether you're joking. You keep saying that enough to kids, they're gonna believe it because it's, the, it's all about the internal tape that you play in your head. And these kids, this is where they're learning it. So they're, they're you know, they're, they're playing that tape over and over again in their head. And uh, the, this is what they start to make, they start to make it true. And they start to believe about themselves. You know what I mean? Regardless whether it's true or not, I'm, I'm, I have a little bit of a struggle that with that with my daughter right now that she does that. She says the things over and over again to herself in her head and ultimately makes it true because what you say and what you think is what you will be. Mm -hmm. And so like these kids, they don't know 
they say these 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 words to kids and they just say, oh, I'm just joking, but these kids, they hear it over and over again in their head at school. The kids are saying it at school and at daycare and this is what they become. That's all just saying, like, I'm surprised that the schools, they don't have a positive affirmation little drill that they have in the schools, like at the beginning of the day, at the, the end of the day, would literally take like five minutes. You know, you have these, these words, these, these sayings that you get your kid, the kids to say. And I mean, uh, I know it sounds crazy, but you literally have to brainwash yourself in order to unlearn the stuff that you've learned. So all they would have to do would be like the national anthem that they sing in the morning. I could recite that over and over again, no problem, because they burnt it into my head, right? Every morning, stand up for the national anthem, right? But what if they had the positive affirmations for the kids every single day, just like that? The kids would be, they would learn that stuff every day, and it would, it would be the words that they say to themselves over and over again, instead of these negative things that kids teach them. So yeah, I'm just surprised that they don't have something like that. Wonderful. And before we wrap up, I thought if anyone listening right now who is struggling with their own addictions and today is going to be a change, a turning point, what would you be, what would the one message you'd be saying to them right now as they're listening to make that, that change to move forward? I would say the most important thing is just to reach out when you have, when you're feeling those feelings of being down and stressed out or angry or hurt, that the most important thing is to reach out in those moments and don't hold it in because too many of us do it. We stuff it down, right? Stuff it down. And those feelings, those emotions come out in other ways. It'll, you'll never just stuff it down. It won't go away until you talk about it, let it out. So it doesn't even matter even if it's just over messenger or whatever just reach out to somebody you know what I mean tell them how you're feeling and don't be ashamed because we all go through struggles and if anything it takes a lot of courage and guts to to come out and talk to people about what what what's going on so don't be ashamed don't feel down about needing help we all need help at some point in our life That's so true. Well, I really, again, a pleasure, uh, Vincent, being with you today. Very inspiring. Um, some emotional topics, uh, but I think it's, we, we need to talk about that, right? We need to be open about it. And I think the takeaway for sure from what you're saying today is be open, be there for others, and, and reflect within yourself of who you are as a person, who you want to be as a person. Yeah. Don't shy away. Don't shy away from uh, your feelings because they're always going to be there. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And want to thank everyone for listening today. We'll be back with more with our series on the book, All Eyes on Me. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. Yeah, thank